last but certainly not least is Stephen Gates. Um, he came all the way from United States and he's the founder of Crazy Studio and that's also one of his life mottos that he might look crazy but he's certainly not stupid as that, that uh, you already heard on the podcast uh, recording before. And uh, if you Google him, he was working with Apple, Envision, I mean, all, uh, many worldwide known companies. And he received so many awards, so I don't want to take time from him. Um, welcome, Stephen, and let's give him a round of applause. How's everybody doing? I know, look, it's the end of the day, it's like sunny outside, it's a warm room, you've all been sitting here all day, I get it, I get it. Um, but hey, look, at least you're not presenting on jet lag, this is gonna get weird. All right, and I also have to be the one control freak who presents off his own laptop, because, you know, fonts. Thank you to the four people who got that joke. Now's the fun part of either it works or I stand up here and do this with interpretive dance. Ha ha, okay. Um, okay, we're gonna work on it, I'm telling you, we're gonna work on it. Um, so my name is Steve Gates, um, flew in yesterday. Um, I had to compliment Rui, all I'd heard for like three years was like how amazing the weather is and you can come and take a break and it's like this tropical paradise and I landed in like that George Clooney movie where like he sinks in the boat or something, like I don't know, I landed in like a hurricane and I thought I got lied to. Apparently we burned all the weather budget on today. Um, so I don't know, but anyway, <laughs> enough about that. Um, I know my audience, um, so before anybody even asks, this is the font that I use. Um, this is also how I can tell if people pay attention because people will come up and they'll be like, so what font was that? I was like, you weren't there at the beginning of my talk, were you? They're like, no. So anyway, if you ever wanna know, that's what it is. Um, so anyway, I've worked at a bunch of different companies throughout my career. I've worked in big advertising. I've worked at in-house teams. I've worked at consultancies. I worked at Envision for like the one year that company was relevant. Um, <laughs> Hey, look, I was, I, you, you guys laughed. I worked there, like, give me a break, <laughs> right? I went there, like, we're gonna change the world. It was like, oh shit, we don't have a product. <laughs> like, so no, trust me, like, it's okay. This is, these, my talks turn into therapy real quick. Um, everybody, like, everybody had, like, their Apple slides, so, like, I had to throw mine in here. Um, this was, like, one of the coolest moments of my career with Tim Cook actually in front of the app that I designed for Apple Watch. We will come back to that later. Um, so for the last, what, seven plus years, 129 episodes, I've had this passion project called The Crazy One, um, which is really dedicated to what I wanna talk about today, which is I think to, to have a career in this industry, to believe in yourself, to believe in your skills, to stand out inside of your company means you probably have to be a little bit crazy, right? because we exist in an industry that is going to tell you that you need to be just like everybody else, right? It's gonna tell you there's a right way to be able to do things. All that stuff is bullshit, right? So I have spent seven years talking to myself of going through and doing this podcast, and that the one person who listened to the show just laughed at that, so thank you. Um, but that's the thing, right, is I've put, gone together to talk about the stuff that I think most people don't talk about. Because, and I said this before, just because I'm three feet higher up in the air than everybody else does not mean that I have all the answers. It does not mean that I've got this figured out. It does not mean that I'm immune to any of the things that go on. So I think, you know, for me, it's been interesting because about 18 months ago, I got laid off for the third time, third time in my career. And definitely have learned that like working for companies is a real interesting proposition. And either you work long enough to figure out just how expendable you can be, Right? or you'd definitely be able to find that out. So I decided I was gonna start my own design studio. Keeping with my brand, I decided to call it crazy. So I think you know, we go through and we get to work with a lot of incredibly cool um, clients. I had to laugh with the Napster joke before um, because Metallica is actually one of my clients. Um, thank you for still loving them after, like they have some real interesting conversations with Lars about that. So um, yeah, that's actually, I do work for them. We'll talk about that later. But, I, look, I think that for me it is about how do we show up as creatives, right? 
And I think that one of the things that I also am a part of that I'm hugely proud of, if you take nothing away from this talk, I hope that it's this. One of the other things that I was a part of was in 2020 founding a startup called the ADP List, which is the Amazing Design People List, which really looked at, thank you, which really looked at the fact that like for the creative community, the access to mentorship is wildly broken, right? That most people who have knowledge hold on to it and to tend to stand on stages like this and get paid to share it, which I think is bullshit. And so we started this platform that has gone wildly successful. So we have over 5,000 companies, over 12,000 mentors. Every single mentor is vetted to make sure that they know what they are talking about. And this week, we passed the 100 million minutes of free mentorship. So if you're somebody who is a leader who wants to have an influence on the community, please sign up to be a mentor. If you're somebody who is looking for guidance, whatever the company is you want to work for, whatever the person is that you think you really love their career, they probably are on there and giving away mentorship for free. Like I'm on the platform every single week. I do three free mentoring sessions every single week. And again, I think that a lot of this is because, again, how do we give people access to knowledge? Because for me, knowledge isn't power. Giving it away is power. And that's what I'm going to talk about today right, is exist loudly. Because I think for so many creatives and for so many things like that, we have this, it's an inherent problem, right? Because being creative means you are insecure. We all are. Anybody who tells you they aren't is lying. Anybody who tells you they don't have imposter syndrome is lying. Because the problem is, anytime you give us a blank screen, a blank piece of paper, a blank, you know, a camera to take a photo, anything, the mark that you make, the word that you write, the design that you create, anything that you do is personal because it is based on your experience. It's based on your perspective of the world. So of course we take that stuff personally, which creates some level of insecurity. That's what imposter syndrome is. But for me, it's about as creatives, how do we show up and how are the ways that we are actually able to take advantage of the opportunities we have? And so this is the line that I come back to all the time, right? A cover band never changed the world. Had to sort of laugh when I went to lunch with the, the guy playing piano at lunch. I had, had to laugh when I got on the elevator and there's a Beatles cover band apparently here this evening. I was like, this, this, this could not be more perfect. But that's the thing, right? Like for the Beatles cover band that's gonna be here, they're probably not gonna change anybody's life. The Beatles changed a hell of a lot. But that's the problem, right? Is that too many people think they need to be the cover band and not the originator. Because the thing is, like, and it's a natural part of human psychology and creativity, we start to learn by copying other people, right? It's a natural way to be able to do it. But it's about how do we find our voice and how do we start to step away from that that makes the real difference, right? And I think, but doing that, again, comes back to where you need to be a little bit crazy to believe in yourself to do these sort of things. So this is what I think is one of the most breakthrough, one of the best designers, has created one of the most influential pieces of design that has ever probably created in the last 10 to 20 years. I actually was walking around the town yesterday. His work was across the street. Does anybody know who this is? You're, don't, don't spoil it, Rui. <laughs> I'll even give you his name. So his name is Shingataka Kurita. Still nobody. Okay, so what he created, which I, like I said, is one of the most influential pieces of design, is he created this. It's not the jet lag, I haven't lost my mind, right? But the reason why I think like it's so amazing, because like think about this process, right? Think about that you've come up with this, so that he looked at the emoji system and he said, you know what this is missing? <laughs> and it wasn't just that, right? But that he actually went and he took it into a meeting and sold, can you imagine being in that meeting? Can you imagine? Like, being, like, guys, there's something we need to talk about. I've got this idea. Like, okay, cool. And you sit down, and he's like, okay, here's what I'm thinking. You know what we need? Poop. <laughs> and he got them to buy into it. Like, dude is my hero, right? Like, that, that is what, like, existing loudly, and do, like, that is just crazy to look at that and be like, you know what this is missing? And it, so, like, look, I mean, it's half a joke, but it's not, because it's just, it's obvious that something like that has had such an amazing impact, because, like, that was on a pillow across the street. I'd love to meet the person that's like, hey, that's what my house needs. But it's just like, look, but I think that's the part of it. And that's a lot of it, right? Like how, what does it look like to build a breakthrough career? Whenever we talk about doing that sort of thing, when we talk about believing in yourself and doing that sort of thing, what does that mean? And so what I want to talk about today are like, what are the most common traps, right? Like I've talked to and mentored hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the world. I talk to creatives all the time from the most senior, extremely popular, you'd know who they are, to people who are just starting out in the industry. 
And there are so many questions that are so similar. And I think the first one that I get all the time is around what I'll describe as the script trap, right? Which is that people will come to me, people today were like, hey, I'm not sure I'm building my career the right way. Am I doing this the right way? Should I be doing this? What program should I learn next? Like there are these sort of things. And here's the thing that I'm gonna tell everybody, right? Is that this is the problem is that a lot of times we believe this is what your career should be, right? You start here, then you go here, and you work your way up the pyramid. Or God forbid, like this, don't take a photo of this stuff. Don't, don't, nobody, don't take, don't spread this. Nobody photograph this. This is bullshit, right? Or again, a major university teaches that this, this is a possibility for how to have a career, right? What the, this looks like mousetrap, right? Like this is, this is like a screwed up UI flow. This isn't a career. But that's the problem, right? Is that we're sort of taught that there is a way to be able to do this stuff. And here's the thing I wanna tell you, right? There is not a right way to be a creative. There is not a right way to be a designer. The best way to know if you are on the right path, and we talked about this a little bit before, is if you are doing what you love, if you are doing what you believe in, if you think you have a really good skill in that, the money and the jobs will come. It may not always feel like that, but that is the best way to know that you are on the right track. The worst thing that you can do, that so many people that I end up coaching, so many people that I end up talking to, have spent too long in their career showing up as who they thought people wanted them to be, not as who they are. I am one of them, right? I have tattoos on both forearms, including I have here's the crazy ones on this one, and I have a pencils and lightning bolt on this one. This is not some Apple fanboy tattoo. This is because I spent way too long in my career giving a damn what everybody else thought, trying to be who they wanted me to be, trying to show up and be more palatable and be more of who they wanted me to be. And it wasn't it funny that the moment that I started being more true to myself, the moment I started doing the work that I thought was what I wanted to do is when my career exploded, right? It was not by mistake that those two things went hand in hand. But this is the thing, is that no one would tell you my career was a good idea. That's why I said before, like everybody sees the destination, they don't see the journey. Nobody would be like, you know what you should do? Start your dad's advertising firm, then decide that you want to, don't want to be like your dad and go into special effects, right? Then come back into advertising. Then after that, go into hospitality, finance, go to a SaaS company, wellness, before starting your own company. Nobody's going to be like, yeah, that's a good idea and it's going to end well, <laughs> right? Talk to anybody who you admire and ask them what their career path is. Nobody's going to be like, yep, got it right all the time. But somehow we have this idea that like everybody else is somehow doing it right. Like somehow like, oh, there's this certain order I have to go in to do it right. That's never, just read a job description, right? That's the biggest, like that's just insane is trying to figure that stuff out. But that's the thing. There's not a right way to be able to do this, but somehow we all have this feeling like we're not measuring up. And so that's the first myth that I want to dispel, right? There is not a way to be able to do it. it, it that's one of the biggest things I'm trying to do with my brand is destroy that I know what I'm talking about. Right, because again, I'm just as subject to mental health issues, to imposter syndrome, to all the insecurities of not having, like there's not this place when people make it, right? That's not to be discouraging, but it's just because again, that's just part of the creative condition, which I think goes to the next thing. And one of the most sobering things that I've seen in terms of doing the amount of mentoring that I have is the amount of mental health issues that a lot of people have that I really think go untreated or go untalked about. And that comes in a lot of different forms. But I think a lot of people come to me and they say, look, like, why don't I love what I do all the time? Why am I not happy all the time? Why do I not feel like I'm accomplishing, like everybody else, and again, like everybody on social media is so happy and they're always sitting there like looking into a sunset with an eagle on their shoulder and like whatever. <laughs> look, and a lot of you in here were guilty. I saw the selfies on the balcony, right? Like don't, <laughs> don't, don't start with me, right? Like I saw a lot of people who are like, you know, killing it. And so, but that's the thing is I think, <laughs> A couple of you laughed a little harder than others. Like, I'm gonna go find that. I'm gonna go use that hashtag and I'm gonna find the selfies. But this is the thing, right? Is that for a lot of people, it's like, you know, why am I not as happy as the image that I portray? Why am I not doing as well as, again, the way I make it look to everybody else? And I think that this is a lot of the cases of what's going on is that whenever you think about it, I think this is what people think their life should be, right? Is it's just constant, got it pegged, I'm happy all the time. Well, that's not actually the way that it works. And again, I think this has been a big part of my mental health journey, is figuring out just how unrealistic this is, right? And I said this before, and I wanna say it again. One of the biggest problems that we have is we compare our insides to everybody else's outsides, which means I'm looking at my insecurities, I'm looking at the things that I don't think I'm good enough at, I'm looking at all the things that little voice 
that little insecurity voice, and I'm comparing it to everybody else's external image, which has none of those things. It's a comparison that we will lose 100% of the time. And that's the funny part is, again, as soon as you stop thinking, oh, I need to be like everybody else, it's amazing how much better your career can get. Because here's the other thing to realize is whenever you actually study psychology, happiness is a target. It's not a state, right? Which means happiness is a goal that if I go through, if I get this job, if I launch this product, if I speak at this event, right, then I'm going to be happy. Well, the problem is whenever you set those targets, whenever I get that job, whenever I launch that product, whenever I speak at that event, great. I've achieved that target, and so I am then happy for an extremely short amount of time. I think my, the best work I've ever done gave me pure, pure joy for maybe 72 hours max, right? And then the problem was that whenever that happens and you hit that, well, your brain goes, cool, we did it. We need to come up with something new. So then it sets a new goal, and it recalibrates to something new, and then you're not happy again. And then, so again, you're constantly chasing goal after goal after goal, and whenever you look at that, it's incredibly hard because creativity is emotional, right? It is a mental state more than anything. And so you need to think about that just like an instrument or like anything else. And so if you're constantly living in this, I'm not good enough, small little spikes of happiness, right? That's how casinos work. That's how slot machines work, right? Like you get a little payout every once in a while and you will sit there and go broke waiting for that next little payout. As opposed to thinking about how do you actually figure out what do you love, right? What gives you joy? What are the things whenever you show up? Is it working with your teammates? Is it being creative? Is it sketching? Like, what are the things that you love doing every day and giving this stuff more weight, right? Of really looking at what are the things that you need to be creative? Because one of the biggest problems as creatives is that what we do is we tend to take on everybody else's shit and make the best of it, right? Like that product owner who you work with who's a complete dumpster fire and you hate the way that they work, but you know what, you work that way anyway because it's, it's better than having an argument with them. Like, we tend to just take on this stuff as opposed to saying, look, this is what I need to be successful. This is how I need to show up. This is what I need to be able to do to do my best work. Because it's amazing how many teams I go into coach, and I say, how many things do you need to find this joy? And they're like, five. I'm like, how many do you get on a day-to-day -day basis? They're like, one. It's like, math isn't hard here to be able to figure out what the problem might be. So I think the other thing for me, and we, we've touched on this a little bit, and this is an incredibly understandable problem because especially right now, the industry has lost its mind, right? I think, again, I was one of the, the early victims in going into like seeing, and this is what drives me crazy, right? Is that people like us, designers, creatives, we're the ones that pay the price for CEOs and executive stupidity. They mismanage the companies, they have bad financial results, and people like us are the ones that get laid off. And that's ridiculous. But I think whenever you're doing that, I think, this is what a lot of people ask me, right? Why am I not getting more interviews? Why am I not doing better? Why am I not getting more recognized? Why is my career not more of a breakthrough? And I get them to send me their resume, get me to send them their portfolio, and I go through and start to look at this stuff. And so there is a trap in our brain. Because when you're in the place when you want a new job, whenever you want to build your brand, whenever you're doing any of these things, your brain says you need to appeal to everybody. Right? There's not an opportunity you can pass up. There's not a thing that we need to take advantage of every possible thing that's out there. Well, just like with any design, just like building any brand or doing anything else, when you appeal to everyone, you appeal to no one. Because the other part of this is realizing, like applying for jobs is insane. <laughs> and I use that word a lot. Because if, if you looked at really before the current state of where the economy is right now, applying for a job worked about 2 to 4% of the time. Right now, it works about 1% of the time. The only thing that I see so many people engage in that works so infrequently is the lottery, right? That it used to be that an average job got about 200 applications, now the average is about 1,000. So we're going into a, an area where the odds are absolutely stacked against us trying to look like everybody else, and then wondering, why don't we get noticed? But this is the problem, right? Is at the end of the day, companies do not hire generic talent. Right? We've heard about that multiple times through this conference, right? The ability to stand out, to articulate why you are different. That yes, that probably is going to mean you're not going to appeal to everybody. But to me, and we're going to talk about that in a second, right? I think that's why it's so good. Because the best thing that you can do is to know your value. To know what you are. And again, I don't care if you've been in this industry like two days or 30 years. Who you are the way you were raised, what your background is, your perspective on the world, all those things that make you different, those are your superpowers. 
but we exist in an industry that will teach you that like, oh, if you're not like everybody else, that's somehow a weakness, right? And it's just, it's this insane paradox where it's like, we want people that are gonna stand out and we're gonna break things and do this innovative work and we're gonna celebrate what they do, but whenever we hire you, we'd love for you to look like everybody else, right? And so I think it really does come down to knows, knowing what makes you different. And look, I think that this is the, like one of the things I believe in most, right? Through all the years of all the brands that I have built, this is the way that I treat my own brand. So this is something that I live, right? Whenever I go in and I work with a company, the thing that I say is at the end of the day, you want to build a brand that somebody hates, right? One of the, you know, I built W Hotels. Whenever we built W, for some people, that was an awesome place, and it was a playground, and there was like the DJ music, and there's the mood lighting, and it was a really great place. For other people, it was Sodom and Gomorrah, because there was like a human Sunday option on the menu and room service. Cool, that's what we wanted. Again, for me, for my personal brand, there's a lot of employers that look at me and are like, nope, not for me, right? We, we just want somebody who's gonna be more quiet, who's gonna blend into the background. Cool, right? Yes, I'm missing out on that opportunity. It's one I didn't want. But this is the way I would tell you to think about your brand and the way you put yourself out into the world, is if you think about, I want to build a brand that somebody hates. That means that you are actually creating something that is strong enough, that is clear enough about what it is that for those people who love it, damn, they love it and they want to be a part of it. And for those who don't, cool, right? Like, great, you should not need to feel like you need to be for everybody. But I think that's one of the biggest problems that we have is that again, it's like, well, I need to appeal to everybody. Again, no matter what stage you are in your career, to try to stand out, to be different. Again, you know, we talked about this before. Every, every portfolio I see starts with like the same paragraph that's like 50 words that say nothing. Right? It's like, I'm a UX designer who loves human-led interactions, and it's really all about, it, like, cover up, just pull up a portfolio and cover up the name. Could you tell me who it was for? 99, 95% of the time, the answer is no because it, the, those words could apply to anybody. They can apply to everybody, right? And again, I think that that's the thing is like, be memorable, never apologize for like standing out. I know that it's hard and whenever you aren't like everybody else, but damn, there's a lot of power and the ability to do that. I think we've talked about this and I mentioned it a little bit on the panel as well. I think there's also the trap around technology, right? I got asked this on stage, I get asked this all the time. Like, what's the next technology? What do you think about AI? What should I learn next? What's the next app? What's the next? And, and look, I, mean, I think as somebody who has done a lot of work in innovation, somebody who has launched a lot of big innovations over my career, this is not the way I think about it, right? That for me, like this is just the last couple years, right? This list will look different next year. It'll look different the year after that. Now there are certain things on here that are definitely gonna have a bigger impact than others. Right, like AI is this, is, this is going to be a bigger impact and influence than a lot of things we've seen. It's not the first time we've seen a big change in our industry, right? Gutenberg invented the printing press. Everybody went, holy shit, we're putting words on paper, right? We've seen it with desktop publishing. Like we've seen it, like this is not a new problem, but like we're like, oh my God, this has never happened before. Again, I think there's different implications to that. Again, like there's crypto, there's a lot of technology, there's a lot of things on here that could have value but it's how you use it. And I think that the way that I've always sort of thought about this stuff is like technology is not an idea. You wanna have a real short meeting with me, walk in and say, you know what, I think we should be on TikTok. Get the hell out of my office, right? Leading with that to do it just the way that everybody else does. Some of the biggest successes that I've been the most proud of weren't that we were the first to use a technology, it's that we were the first to stop using a technology, right? That we went in, we tried it out, we looked around, we saw what the value was and we said, you know what? We don't think that there's a long-term like plan or there's a long-term benefit here. So some of the stuff I'm the most proud of is that we were the first ones to go, cool, we're done. But this is the thing, right? Is at the end of the day, and this is, I talked about this on the panel before, it's a pencil. That it is about what does it enable? What are the things that just like a pencil, it's about the mark you make, the word you write, the thing you do, the impact it has. That's what the actual outcome is. That's what the successful startups, that's what the successful things do is it's about what is the impact they have. Right? And again, I think we tend to get very, very caught up in the executional aspect of that. And again, I think this is the sort of thing where for me, the way that I'd always encourage everybody to do this, stop being afraid of AI, right? Stop being afraid of any new technology. Then what you wanna go do is to actually learn it, right? Go trade in crypto, try an AI, try out Firefly, like go write a prompt and be able to do it in mid-journey. Experience it for yourself. Don't have secondhand experiences. Right, because for me, and this is the way I do user research, this is the way I look at technology, 
It is getting involved firsthand to go in and look at it and say, how does this work? Where's the opportunity? What do I think about it? Because when you do this, then maybe you see opportunities that everybody else doesn't. And then I think once you're able to do that, then it's about, okay, great, now let's decide where do we want to invest. Now it's about what are the things where it makes sense. I'll give you a very relevant example. So this, again. So I've been lucky enough over the course of my career, I think my work has appeared 10, in 10 different Apple keynotes. I was one of the first five outsiders that Johnny I have called to be able to work on the Apple Watch five months before it was announced to the public. Um, if you ever want to work on one of the most terrifying things in the world, work on unreleased Apple hardware. Right, like it is, they, they, they make, their NDAs will terrify anybody. But so this was the outcome, right? There's Tim standing in front of my design, isn't that cool? But again, the way, this is not the way it started. It started with this train wreck. Does anybody remember this piece of shit? Google Glass, for those of you who don't know what it is, don't waste your time by looking it up. Even though Ray-Ban might be able to after what they've recently done with Meta. But this was the thing, right? Google came out with this. This was gonna be the future of wearables. And so I went out and signed up to be a Google Glass Explorer and I walked around, including in Grand Central Station with this idiotic thing strapped to the middle of my face. Well, the reason why I did that was not, because I looked at this from the beginning and I'm like, this is going to be a failure, right? Because they never took into account what is it going to be whatever you are walking around with a camera in the middle of your face with a screen that only you can see and nobody else can see, right? The social interaction for that was always going to be a dumpster fire. But we actually did, we went through and we developed an app for this. And we launched it and everybody was like, what the hell are you doing? Like, that's a horrible piece of technology. And I said, I know. And they're like, no, no, but why are you doing it? I said, no, I know it's horrible, just hold on. Well, the whole reason why we did this was because after we developed that, I sent an email unknown to my bosses to all of our contacts at Apple that said, hey, if you guys are really building that watch that everybody has a rumor about, I've got some ideas because we've actually been designing for this. Well, wasn't it then amazing that we got one of the calls to be one of the first people to go and work on that? It wasn't because this was a good idea, right? It was that this was a means to an end, that we could evaluate it on our own, and that while, yes, this was a trash experience and not everybody else saw it, it led to the much bigger thing that was down the road. Because again, we saw an opportunity there that not everybody else saw. Again, talking about these guys. So this was from a shoot that I recently did with the guys in Metallica. So again, biggest band in the world, been around for 42 years, highest grossing band of all time. I wish, you don't know how much I wish, how many leaders I work with could sit down with these guys because they have not been this successful for this long by mistake. Because there's other stuff where we've gotten rid of all the photo shoots. I talked about this before, right? They would spend 20, 40, 60, $100,000 on these photo shoots because we do stuff for the band, we do stuff for their whiskey. This is their new holiday campaign. The only thing that's real is this bottle, which was shot, in, which was shot on the desk of my office in my house. That the rest is all done with Mid Journey and it's done with Firefly. And or that's the thing, we just went to them and said, hey look, we think we can save you a whole bunch of money and we can work completely differently, right? So that this is what our flows look like now, where it's a bunch of whiteboarding sessions where we come up, so this was the holiday campaign, you'll see it this holiday, it's called Sounds Like the Holidays. But now we can work with them completely interactively. We can work in real time with what that is. We can get away with photo shoots, right? It's a completely different way of working. But we did it by jumping in, trying it, and also that's the nice part is whenever in our studio, when we show up as creatives who understand what we're good at and we can define what that is, we work with clients who also say, you know what, we trust you. Because that's the other part of it, is with a lot of this sort of work, you need somebody that's gonna let it see the light of day. But that's the thing, right? It's a completely different way of working, but for us, there were reasons why we're doing this, right? And so again, we're staying away from people because everybody has six fingers in mid-journey. Um, but, <laughs> but that's the thing, right? Think for yourself, and I said this before, take the notes that you have here, take the things that you wanna learn, but go do it yourself. Don't walk away from here and say, well, somebody on stage said that I should go do that, right? That is a recipe for a really mediocre career and for not getting noticed, right? The ability to go and look at it and then embrace that, wow, I think I could use that in a different way, right? This is why a lot of technology companies, I drive them crazy, because I'm like, can I, put it, you know, can I put it on the ceiling? Can I get it wet? What if I give it to a horse, right? Like, it's like, what? None of those were jokes, right? But I think that's the thing, is to actually look at technology, and again, it's a pencil. Think for yourself about how you want to use it. And I think the last part of this for me is the needs trap. Because for so many of us, I think we're trying to get somebody else to tell us who we are. And that's the hard part about being a creative, right? Is that again, what our superpower is what makes us different, but that also means that the answers that we're looking for 
have to come from us. We're going to write books on creativity and leadership and these things until the world ends because people are looking for the secret. The one question I get all the time, people are like, Steve, I loved your career. What's the secret? The problem is in your question. There isn't one. Like, you know what the secret is? Work your ass off for 20 years and just keep repeating it until it happens, right? That's the secret. But I think that this is what a lot of it is, is I think it is how do you know what you want to get out of your career? Because this is, again, one of the things I coach so many people on is that you have to be able to define that. And look, I recently went through a real crisis of after being so unhappy for so long at working at so many in-house jobs to sit down and go, what do I want? Not what do I think the industry wants? Not what do I think everybody else wants me to be? Not what do I think people on stage want me to be? What do I want? And to come to realizations that like, you know, whenever I'm gonna start my own studio, what do I need? I need things like, look, I like to work on the problems. I don't like being a part of big teams. I don't like it where I'm more of like a politician and a negotiator or a therapist or an interventionist more than I'm a creative or a strategist, right? So I don't wanna work in those sort of ways anymore. That again, I need to actually be engaged in the work. I love being a designer. That's the cruel part of this industry is the longer you're in it, the more it tries to take you away from what you love. Okay, I didn't want to do that anymore. I want to get back to actually doing the work. That for these things, like I love diverse problems because I got to a point in this industry where it was like my experience felt like it was a liability. And so again, like look, we're doing AR experiences and photo shoots. I'm designing a restaurant. I'm designing like the stage for a world tour. Like we do all of it. And again, every, same thing, whenever I said I was gonna do that, everybody's like, you're crazy, and then people hired us, and they're like, we knew it, shut up. <laughs> Look, but I think a lot of it is for me is that also, I, I, I have to work with people who respect my talent, right? I am so sick of being told to make it pretty. I am so sick of, again, just somebody who just sort of nods and smiles and just, you know, let's design, do whatever it is they want, or it's like, okay, we're just gonna humor them. Right, I'm, I'm so, and it's amazing to me. It's so empowering, it is so wonderful to like talk to a prospective client and be like, yeah, there's no way we're gonna work together. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, I can tell now there is no way you guys do good work. Like, what do you mean? I'm like, I can tell by your process and how political you are. I can tell by the fact that your org chart matches your website navigation. We're not gonna do good work together. No, no, but we want to. I'm like, no, no, I understand you want to, but that's the thing, right, is that for me, at the end of the day, you are not gonna respect what we do. And like, this is my life's work. This is not a joke, right? I'm not here to waste my time. I'm here to be taken seriously and to do shit that matters. But again, I think a lot of it was for me, and this was such the hard thing, was I needed to prioritize my creativity, my skills, my mental health, and my happiness. To actually think that being happy with what I was doing was possible again, right? It wasn't that I'd fallen out of love with design or leadership. It was that I'd fallen out of love with the way design and leadership was treated at too many companies. Right? That was what I'd fallen out of love with. And because look, at the end of the day, this is one of the biggest things that I hope people remember, right? There is a massive, and I mean massive difference in how you move through your career. You can move through and say, this is what I wanna do. This is what I wanna accomplish. This is what I want to work on. And then find the companies that align with those values. Find the companies that will support what that is. Or what too many other people do is that they just take what gets given to them, right? The biggest way that I always can tell this is I'll ask how many people actually like negotiated their last salary? Seriously, how many of you actually negotiated your last salary? Okay, we're gonna say what? Conservatively, maybe 10% of the room? Right, because most people, what's the thinking? You're giving me a job, I should be grateful, right? Fuck that. <laughs> Seriously, like because at the end of the day, you are there to contribute to that company. You are there to make them money. You are there, and again, you need to negotiate and to show up and get what you want, not what they will give you. Because again, so many people that I coach, the reason why they break down, the reason why they fall out of love, is I'll say, well look, why'd you take your last promotion? It's more money. Great, are you doing work you love? It's more money. It's like, great, but like, again, are we not, like am I speaking in tongues? Are we not seeing how these two things are connected? But that's the thing, and look, I just think, I'm gonna leave you with one final thought about this, is, um, if you don't know who this woman is, I would highly, highly encourage you. So Sylvia Baffour, I'm lucky enough, she's one of my personal advisors, she's like my personal Yoda. Um, she, has a, she has an amazing book, she's an expert on emotional intelligence, she has a book called I Dare You to Care, she has a podcast by the same name. Um, she was mentored by Maya Angelou for like 14 years, like way smarter than I will ever, like I draw for a living. And I was having a conversation with Sylvia before I started the studio. And I'm going on about all the problems, and I'm going on about all the, like, the reasons why it's not working, and the companies who don't like me, and all this sort of stuff. 
And she has this amazing way of just cutting right through it. And she just, she just said, Steve, look, I need you to remember that, dis that discomfort is the cost of success. Right? That all the things that you want to do, all the places that you want to be different, all the things that you say you want to be are on the other side of you being uncomfortable. Because the problem was I was at a point in my career where all I could see was what I could lose. I didn't see what I could gain. Right? And that now <laughs> I'm happier that I've been in 10 or 15 years. Right? Because every single day I get up and look forward to being uncomfortable. Every single day I get up to solving problems I've never solved before. I've never designed a restaurant before. Like, great, let's go watch a bunch of YouTube and figure it out. Right? Like, but again, there's so many ways to be able to do that, that this for me, like, right, discomfort is the cost of success. And that's my biggest hope for all of you, right, is to come here today, to get inspired, to have ideas, to figure out what you want to work on, but then go get uncomfortable. Go make other people uncomfortable, right? Push them with your ideas. Be yourself. Show up in those sort of ways, right? I think for me, that's the, the essence of what Exists Loudly is about. It is, again, how do you show up and make your mark? How do you live your truth? How do you let your creative power have the influence that it should on people? Right? Don't let the people you work with, the companies you work with, make you smaller. Don't make them make you believe that your talent is less than what it is. I don't care where you live. Again, this is a big part of the world. Just because you're here in, in the southern part of Portugal does not mean you cannot go out and do work that can influence anybody. Right? The world has changed in the ability to do that. It is, again, up to so many of us for how do we want to show up. So that's my hope for you, and I'll say thank you with that, but just exist loudly. <laughs>